So hi and welcome to our session on SUSE maintenance operations on AWS. My name is Stephen Mogg, I'm a solutions architect here at SUSE and I'm happy to be joined by David Rocher. David, do you want to say hello? Yeah, hi Stephen, thank you. And I do want to point out that Stephen and I, our focus is bringing SUSE products and services to AWS customers. And of course, we do work with SUSE customers to help them use AWS services as well. Brilliant, thanks. So in the next 25 minutes or so, what we're actually going to do is try and answer some of the more frequently asked questions that we get from, from SUSE and AWS, effectively our, our joint customers, around patching and maintaining the SUSE Linux Enterprise OS on the AWS platform. So those questions normally revolve around four areas from you know, how do I access the updates through to which tooling to use, and even how to do things like uh, upgrade from, from SLES 12 to, to, to SLES 15 with workloads running in AWS. And we'll finish up with a section around some of the AWS considerations as well, um, and some of those things that need to be taken into account when patching and, and doing some of those upgrades with those AWS workloads. So let's start with how to access updates. Now, depending on the type of workload you're running and how you're consuming the SUSE subscription itself, then there are a number of different options open to you for, for how to get those patches. Now, for the purposes of this session, what I want to do is focus on the on-demand model or the pay-as-you-go model. And that's where you purchase both the, uh, both the infrastructure and the SUSE subscription via AWS. So you can see that there are two main options when you get your patches from. The first is to use SUSE's public cloud update infrastructure. And the second is to use a private repository. And there are pros and cons of, of each method. So for example, using a, a private repository such as SUSE Manager is normally seen as one of the, the best and most comprehensive solutions for customers managing SAP workloads. But if you don't want to manage your own update server, you don't need a, a, a private repository, then you can use the SUSE's cloud update infrastructure itself. So what is this update infrastructure? So at a very high level, it's a, a service which SUSE run. Uh, we maintain it and it runs in AWS. Um, the patches that we have on the update infrastructure are regularly mirrored from the SUSE customer center itself. And you can kind of think of the, the SUSE customer center or the SCC as a, a SUSE mothership where we store and publish all of the latest fixes and updates and uh, for, for all the different supported operating systems. Now your instance that is running in, in AWS will have some, some metadata, which David is, is gonna cover uh, a little later. Uh, and that identifies it as an on-demand instance uh, with a valid subscription. And that allows it access to the update infrastructure itself and allows it to pull down all the fixes and updates that it needs from our service. Now the SUSE update infrastructure or the public cloud update infrastructure, the, 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 the name uh, is interchangeable, but it, it isn't one server, right? So represented by the green and the yellow dots you can see on the diagram here, SUSE have deployed a, a series of update servers into all the different regions where you can run SUSE Linux in AWS. Now the yellow dots represent something called a region server and that acts uh, essentially as a kind of a first port of call from the SLES and SLES for SAP clients that are looking to connect to the patching service. The green dots are the update servers themselves, and that's where the clients will connect to to get the actual updates themselves. Now, you'll be able to see that there are multiple green dots or multiple update servers in each of the regions, and each of these update servers are spread across the different availability zones as well. And quite simply, that, that's about availability. By hosting multiple update servers in each region and using the, the SLE HA or the SLES HA extension uh, to build Linux clusters around the service, we're actually making the service highly available and, and making sure that's as available to customers as possible. Now, the other benefit of, of running this type of solution, it can grow alongside AWS. So as new regions open, and, and many have opened over, over the last year or so, we can simply drop in another set of update servers into that region uh, to ensure that SUSE customers can patch efficiently. And I think uh, as of this month, there are around 100 or so different servers forming this service in AWS. So my, why might you want to, to use the update infrastructure itself? Well, the first one is it, it's, it's kind of great for, for transient workloads, right? The instances will connect automatically as they boot. As, you, know, as, you don't have to register or do anything like that. Everything is automatic. Um, so 
as instances are started, they already have patches available. So there's there's no kind of user operator uh, or user operation required. The second is speed. All right. So because the update servers are in region, uh, it's going to be much faster than than pulling from the the SUSE customer center directly, or potentially even from your own uh, your own private infrastructure if you have a, a global fleet of servers. Now the third benefit is is around cost. Right. So if customers don't necessarily want to go to the expense of building their own repositories, you know, that would potentially mean additional cost in compute, storage, um, maybe network costs as well. Um, because SUSE maintain this service, it's one thing that, that customers don't necessarily have to do. And the last one is, you know, it, it is a highly available service. I've mentioned we already use the uh, SUSE HA capability to ensure the service is, is always available. Um, so that's a, one of the, the, the benefits as well. So let's take a quick look about how clients connect. So if you want to know a little bit more about what's happening behind the scenes when, when the clients connect, um, we're basically going to go through the, the actual connection process now. So regarding architecture itself, uh, everything resides in AWS. The update servers reside in AWS, but the actual VPCs they reside in are, are, are SUSE operated VPCs. All the connectivity is going to be via HTTPS, so that's a quite a well, well used, well known protocol. And I've already mentioned that all the update servers are, are placed in various availability zones across the different regions. As for connectivity, there's, there's three steps. So when a, an instance tries to connect to the update infrastructure, the first thing it'll do is try and contact one of the region servers. That was one of the yellow dots that we had uh, on the diagram earlier. Um, the IP addresses for these are actually baked into the AMI that you launch from, so that they're, they're coded in. And we have around six of those uh, region servers around the globe, and you can potentially connect to, to any one of those. Now, that region server will respond with the data for the nearest update server that's in the same region or the nearest region uh, to the client instance itself. And once the client has that information, it will then go and make a connection to the update server, and the patches will become, uh, become available. So one of the key parts is about uh, one of the key parts about using the service is is simply about connectivity. Um, you're going to have to ensure that your instances will have the ability to connect to those update servers. So that means opening firewalls, potentially security groups, um, knackles, anything like that. Any networking which is between you and the update servers will need to ensure that you can get to some of those defined endpoints uh, that, that form SUSE's update infrastructure. So. The question is going to be where are you going to find out those IP addresses? So that's one of the common questions we get. And the answer to that is SUSE has a tool called Pint, which can be used to, to, to gather all the information that you need for this task. Now, it's available in both a, a command line tool or via a web interface, but it gives you the ability to easily find all the IP addresses that you need so that you can ensure your instances can, can access those servers. Now, you can see from the uh, from either the, the, the console screenshot on the left or the, the web output on the right, you can see that the various different servers will each have their own tags. So you can see the region server has its own type in the output and the update servers themselves have uh, a tag called SMT next to them. Now, the important thing to remember is that you'll need to safe list all six region servers because the, the SLE instance will, I guess, in theory, be able to contact any one of those. And then as for the update servers, you'll need to safe list all your in-region update servers which are closest to your instance and make sure there's connectivity between the two. Now, the IP addresses themselves, they haven't changed in, in the 12 or so years of running this service, so you should only have to do this, this process once. But I will ask you to, to check the connectivity if you do want to use the service because uh, network connectivity probably forms 99% of the support tickets that we get on, on this particular topic. So now your instances are connected to the SUSE update infrastructure. Uh, how can you go about patching? So take a look at part of the diagram that we had from earlier. So the thing I want to keep in mind is the SUSE update infrastructure is a mirror of all the patches in the customer center. So any new fixes and updates that SUSE publish um, will be quickly mirrored down to the update infrastructure in AWS. And that means the contents of those repositories are being, uh, being updated all the time. Uh, so if you go to patch a, an instance on Monday, and then you go and patch another instance on Friday, you could, if you don't have any controls around that, have a completely different set of patches on it, depending on what's been released 
during the week. So when it comes to patching, obviously uh, our enterprise customers trying to add a little more control uh, around the, the patching process itself. Now the choices for, for patching tools are, are plentiful, but I wanted to focus on, on the common ones that we, that we see used out in the field. Now I've already mentioned Susan Manager, and I've already mentioned that it's probably a great solution if you need staging or adding a, a, a good amount of control for workloads such as SAP. Um, we don't have time to cover it in this short session, so I'll, I'll link to some other SUSECon sessions at the end where you can learn a little bit about, more about SUSE Manager. But the other two session, uh, sorry, the other two um, tools that are commonly used is our Zipper and AWS SSM. Now I'll, I'll start a little bit uh, to talk a little bit about Zipper, and then I'll hand over to David who will talk more about SSM. Um, but Zipper itself, I guess the the, the benefit of the operating system is. Um, is that it includes Zipper, right? So there are no agents to deploy. Uh, and it might be a valid option for those that are on a really, really tight budget. Uh, the downside being is you don't necessarily have all the control you need when, uh, when applying updates. Um, so you might need to do a little bit more than, than just Zipper. But for those that do want to, to try it out, let's see how you might use it. So like I say, if you, if you don't need the power of something like AWS SSM or SUSE Manager, then you can you can try this uh, if you need to. So obviously you can use Zipper Patch, but we've already said that the update repositories themselves are, are changing on a daily basis. So this is this is not enough. So what some people do is they'll try and add a little more functionality or a little more control about what's applied um, simply by using the, the date option. So you can see here, we've got uh, the 1st of April um, as a kind of a patching line in the sand. And what we're saying here is we don't want to apply any patches uh, beyond that date. So you can list the patches uh, as per the zipper LP, and then um, you can apply those patches with the, the second command there. Um, now, the thing to be aware of is that uh, the, the date command isn't perfect. It's it's pretty good, but it's, it's, it's not perfect. So whilst the date option will limit the date of which the the patches themselves are issued, it might not limit the release date of the actual RPMs used to, to resolve those patches. So um, patches themselves are effectively, they're, they're kind of a, a meta package and depending on how they're constructed, it means that some of those RPMs that get installed might be included from, from after the date you set. Now, for those who want to read a little bit more about that and, and how that um, affects things, there's a, a technical document at the bottom of this slide. But for those that want a little more control, there is uh, AWS SSM. And for that, I'll hand over to David. All right, thanks, Stephen. And in this section, I will cover AWS Systems Manager and specifically the patch manager feature and how customers can use it to patch their systems. So let's take a look. Now, before we talk about patch managers, let's touch on what is AWS Systems Manager. Um, there are a lot of features and benefits that AWS Systems Manager provides, but at its core, it is a secure end-to-end -end management solution for resources on AWS, multi-cloud, or in hybrid environments. And it allows you to centralize operational data from all, from all your multiple AWS services and automate tasks across your resources on all of your environments. Now, System Manager provides you a central view and the ability to manage your resources so you can have complete visibility and control over your operations. Now, there are a lot of features on this slide, but we're only going to focus on the patch manager feature that's circled on the far right of the screen. We, we won't um, touch on the other features. So systems manager securely communicates with a lightweight agent that's installed on your servers um, you can execute uh, management tasks, provide system management information for your Windows systems, Raspberry Pi, Mac OS, or Linux systems, regardless where that server is running. And the SSM agent is open source and available on GitHub, but for SLES and SLES for SAP that's provided by AWS, the agent is included with the Amazon machine image. And that agent that's included with that image is a SUSE supported package that's av available from the public cloud module. Now, the agent allows you to provide configuration management for your resources, as well as remotely manage your servers without actually having to log on to each server. 
Additionally, you can maintain security and compliance by scanning your instances using Patch Manager. So let's take a look at patching with SSM and the Patch Manager feature. So in general terms, using the feature, we can automate our patching operations by defining a criteria or type of updates that you want to scan or install. The standard baseline for Linux includes deploying security patches with the severity of critical or important after seven days. And you always have the chance um, and choice to customize your, your own baselines, right? You can create those. And you can start scheduling your patch operations on a regular basis as per your requirements. So of course, we also allow um, patching in an on-demand scenario. So the on-demand capability can be used in those day zero vulnerability um, issues. And after your patching is completed, you can then aggregate that patch compliance data across all of your accounts with um, resource data syncs. And these um, compliance data will allow you to create reports that will allow you to determine how compliant your managed, managed instances are across your entire AWS organization. Now, let's take a look at defining patch criteria on the next slide. So patch baselines are used to define criteria for the type of updates that you want to scan or install for patching operations. And patch baselines are operating system specific, but you can create multiple baselines for, the, for a single operating system. And the reason you would want to create different baselines is that you could have different environments um, that require different sets of updates at different times. For example, you may have different patching requirements for database servers compared to web servers. So you would want to create a specific patch baseline for each workload. Now, each baseline rule also has its own compliance reporting that could be specified. And this allows you to quickly identify that baseline rule and, and evaluate whether or not you're in compliance with that, with that workload. Now, for Windows workloads, Patch Baseline supports both the operating system updates and Microsoft application updates, such as Exchange Server, Microsoft SQL Server, and more. And for Linux workloads, you can choose to install non-security updates in addition to security updates. But one thing to keep in mind when using um, Patch Manager is that your instances must have access to a repo in order to scan or install the updates. And in SUSE's case, um, that can be SUSE Public Cloud Update Infrastructure that um, Stephen had just covered, SUSE Manager, or um, RMT. And lastly, when your baseline rules, lastly, within your baseline rules, you can specify any exceptions that need to be made. And these can be expli explicitly approved or explicitly rejected patches. Now, rejected patches can either be flat out blocked and never installed, or you can specify that they're only allowed to be installed as a dependency. So let's take a look at running patch operations. So when you're ready to run your patching operations, whether that be ad hoc, um, like on demand, or your scheduled routine, you're going to leverage AWS SSM documents. And in SUSE's case, in SUSE's case AWS has created an AWS SUSE default patch baseline that you can use as is, or you can modify. And running the patches does require an AWS SSM document. So if you're installing patches to resolve a day zero vulnerability, you can provide a YAML formatted list with spe which specifically defines which particular patches that you want to install um, during that patching operation. And we also have flexible reboot options. So you can choose to reboot after the updates have completed, or you can reboot at a later time. And you can centralize the output of your pack, patch execution logs to either S3, or you can export them to CloudWatch logs. And by creating a document with hooks, you can implement multi-step custom patch processes. For example, if you um, know that an application needs to be stopped before a patch is applied, you can choose to stop an application um, stop that application before it's applied. And for more information around AWS SSM and Patch Manager, 
you know, please look at the AWS documentation. There's a lot of great material and insight um, that's available on our site. Thank you, David. So as, as we mentioned at the start, we, we often get asked you know, if a, a customer has SLES 12 SP4 or SLES 12 SP5, how can they then move to, to SLES 15 and, and, and beyond? Um, now, uh, there's a couple of options available, but we're going to talk about the, the, the main one. Um, so I guess if you go back enough years uh, and you wanted to update the Linux system, then you, you kind of had to go up to your your physical server with a, a USB stick or a DVD or even a CD if you things you go back far enough. You put the physical machine, uh, or sorry, you put the CD into the physical machine, uh, boot from the media, and, and then perform the upgrade. Now, obviously, that's not possible in, in the cloud. So, SUSE have had to come up with a solution that allows you to upgrade across major releases without the need to, uh, to insert the media in order to perform the upgrade. Um, now, by offering this, this method, um, it also means that, that customers don't have to redeploy a new instance from the latest AMI. All right? So um, it just means that they can still be on the latest version, but without having to go through, through that sort of disruption. And the solution there is called the, the Distribution Migration System, uh, or, or DMS for short. So it is, I guess it, it, it's the first thing is to, to understand that using DMS is, is what we call an offline upgrade. And, and that means that your instance itself will be down and it'll be unavailable during the, the, the time of the upgrade process. So you will have to plan for this and, and take the necessary outage from your, from your business. Now, one, uh, one commonly tested and, and supported upgrade path is from either SLES 12 SP4 or hopefully uh, SLES or SLES for SAP 12 SP5 through to uh, SLES 15 SP1. Now, the, the packages that, that are delivered by SUSE in the, the public cloud module uh, implement this, this behavior by, by default. So if you are on a, a, an earlier version of SLES or SLES for SAP, perhaps you're, for some reason you, you, you're stuck down on, on SP3, you need to use whatever your existing patching process is to get to, to SP4 or SP5. Uh, well, preferably SP5, uh, until you can use DMS to, to make the leap to, to, to SLE 15. Now, the upgrade itself um, is handled via the network, and it, it uses what we call the, the zipper migration workflow, which sends a request to the repository server, and then it asks that repository server for, for an upgrade path. So in order for that to actually work, you must be connected to a, a SUSE, what we call a SUSE supported repository. Uh, for example, the, the SUSE update infrastructure is one of those. Um, SUSE customer center is another, potentially R RMT is another, but um, you can potentially use all of those uh, and then DMS will, will work correctly. Now, the service will, will respond. Or one, once DMS makes the query, the, the, the repository will respond with a, a list of new repositories which you need to make the upgrade from SLES 12 to, to SLES 15. Um, so if you're not connected to the, the SUSE supported repos, then, then DMS will not work properly. So as for how to, to run the upgrade itself, um, we've got a, a few steps in this slide here, of which the first one I'll always say, partially with a, a, a smile on my face, is that you should always take a backup or a snapshot uh, of the system uh, itself before you, you make any large changes to it. And then, of course, uh, test that backup to ensure you can recover just in case something goes wrong. Now, DMS itself uh, is quite good at rolling back uh, if, if it doesn't work, um, but always you know, make sure you've got that, that backup in, in your pocket just in case it's needed. Uh, the second thing to do is, is prepare the instance itself. So as I've mentioned already, you need to ensure that you're connected to SUSE supported update servers. Um, usually the ones in, in AWS will work fine. Um, and once you have all those repositories available, you can. The next step will be to, to simplify the file systems that, that you have. So, in in order for to, to DMS to have the the easiest way of, of upgrading, the best thing to do is to remove any non OS file systems from the configuration. So I'm talking things like if you have like network file systems, you know, NFS shares, things like that, in your FS tab, just comment those out for the purposes of the upgrade, just to keep things as lean as possible, and that'll simplify the upgrade and it have a better chance of succeeding. And the next thing to think about uh, are the, uh, the various different modules that are available. So again, pretty much everybody that's watching this will be familiar with, uh, with SLES 12. 
And since the start of Slows 12 back in 2014, I think it was, um, the OS itself has been split into to multiple modules. So we've got modules for things like uh, public cloud tooling, web and scripting, uh, and so on. But not all the modules that we had available in Slows 12 and Slows for SAP 12 are available in, in Slows and Slows for SAP 15. Now, specifically, the, the, the two uh, that come to mind initially are the HPC module and the advanced systems module, which were part of uh, SLE 12 and available in SLES 12, but not in SLES 15. So you will have to comment those out or make sure they're removed before using DMS to do the upgrade, um, because there won't be a, a, an offer that can be made by the update servers uh, for those modules and, and the upgrade will fail. So the easiest thing to do is to, to remove the, those two modules uh, from, from, the service, uh, from the server itself. Now, running the upgrade itself, it's it's very simple. All right, you simply install a couple of packages, uh, uh, which are available in the in the public cloud um, uh, module, and and reboot the instance. And then once that upgrade is is underway, it, it can take a period of time, you know, potentially around 15 minutes or so. Um, but during that upgrade, you can follow along, so you can actually SSH into the uh, IP address of the instance itself. Uh, using the user migration and once you're in inside the the instance itself whilst it's performing the upgrade there is a file called distro migration log which you can tell just to see exactly what's going on during the upgrade process itself now once that is finished all right once the, uh, the upgrade is finished your system will reboot and it'll come back up normally um, and but there will be some some post upgrade checks you'll need to do uh, just to make sure everything is uh, clean and tidy once your update is done. So first thing you do is is go and check that uh, um, distro migration log itself. You can follow through just to make sure everything was successful. Um, and providing you're, you're happy, you can go and then check for things like uh, orphan packages. Um, and there might even be some configuration files which have a, a .new extension. So where they couldn't necessarily be merged with, with your customized versions. Um, but these are the same sort of things that you'll get during a standard update process as well. That's not specific to DMS. It's just something that will happen during any, any upgrade process between service packs or, or between major releases. Um, but once you get through that, your, your upgrade is essentially complete. But there are a few AWS considerations that you need to be aware of when upgrading SLES and SLES for SAP in AWS. And for that, I'll hand you back to David. All right, thanks, um, Stephen. So with AWS Marketplace considerations, um, hopefully I bought some time with AWS SSM to, to really go through this and, and um, at a much slower pace because there are a lot of topics and, and a lot of um, new things that, that you may not be familiar with. So the number one most frequently asked question is, if I launch a SLES for SAP server with the AWS Marketplace and I upgrade that instance, does the Marketplace listing change? Now, before I answer that question, of course, it'll be with a no, but we need to learn more about the AWS Marketplace listing. So let's take a look at that. So AWS has been reselling SLES for SAP since 2017 in the AWS Marketplace. And over the past six years, AWS has published SLES for SAP versions all the way from 12 SP1 to 15 SP4. And for each release of SLES for SAP, there is an individual and unique AWS marketplace listing for each version. And when you launch an instance that um, for SLES for SAP from the marketplace, you are purchasing the compute plus the software cost. So let's look at um, the next slide, please. So AWS Marketplace data is immutable, right? This is important and key to the conversation um, when discussing SLES for SAP um, whenever you're buying it from AWS through the Marketplace. So let's take a look at what AWS uses to track the instances launched using those Marketplace listings. So first off, the all AWS Marketplace listings have a unique product ID associated to them. The product ID is used to track the AWS Marketplace products that you subscribe to. And this is important because many of our customers will subscribe to different AWS Marketplace listings for SLES for SAP. 
and launch Amazon EC2 instances from those different SLES for SAP listings. And in the console, right, in the AWS console, you can view your AWS Marketplace subscriptions and see all of the AWS Marketplace listings that you're subscribed to. And the image on the left is how you can launch SLES for SAP using a Marketplace listing. And the image on the right shows the AWS CLI um, where you can view the attributes of that marketplace SLES for SAP Omni, right? That machine, Amazon machine image. And the command results with a product code ID that's associated with that um, Omni and the product code type defined as marketplace. So let's look at um, the next slide. So with the AWS marketplace instance metadata, so additionally, whenever you launch an Amazon EC2 instance, that instance has an identity document that provides um, information about the instance itself to you um, as a customer. The instance identity document can be retrieved by connecting the, um, to our instance metadata service that's available at the instance launch. And the attribute marketplace product codes that's listed in that instance identity document contains the AWS Marketplace product code, which is associated with the listing that was used to launch that Amazon EC2 instance. So going back to the, um, to the, going back to the question, right on, and we'll take a look at the next slide. We know that the AWS Marketplace identifiers, the product ID and the Marketplace product code, they don't change, they're immutable. So if you take an example, um, you know, if you were to launch SLES for SAP 12 SP5, you performed a distribution migration and then a zipper um, migration to SLES for SAP 15 SP4, the AWS Marketplace identifies that instance using the product ID and the Marketplace product code. And in our example, that's associated with the SLES for SAP 12 SP5 Marketplace listing. So when the customer purchases, or you, when you purchase um, annual contracts or you're reviewing your usage charges, that instance will show up as SLES for SAP 12 SB5. And if you contact AWS, SUSE, SAP support, and share the instance support config, it's going to show up as SLES for SAP 15 SB4. So you'll continue to receive support as expected. Um, Hopefully that answered your question. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Uh, thank you, David. So last thing for me to do is is just wrap up this uh, this short session. Um, so I guess if you have made it this far, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope we covered a few of the frequently asked questions uh, in enough detail, and I hope you found that information useful. Uh, one thing I will say is I did promise to to add a a few links to some sessions around SUSE Manager. There's also some further AWS content of, as part of SUSECon 23, so please make sure you check that out as well. And with that, I'd like to say, if you have been, thanks for listening and do enjoy the rest of the sessions.